Um, well, this session, I think we've, um, it's perhaps been a law-free zone and we've mm. talked about um, users and user expectations and some of the challenges, I think, in terms of um, education and galleries reusing content, making it available. So we've got time for a few questions. Is there anyone? There's one here. Can we just wait for the microphone before we start? Thanks very much. Donna, you made me think of something that hasn't come up before today, and that is, what are the rights of the creator in terms of withholding their work? I mean, we're all born into society and socialised and educated and draw inspiration from a variety of sources, including the people with whom we interact and the previous artists or creators whose works we look at or read or interact with. And it's always a moot point then how much of what we produce is our own contribution and how much is built on the fabric of the culture in which we live. It seems to me that that does, to some degree, attenuate my right as a creator to arbitrarily withhold my work from the public, particularly if I've benefited from the government's action in providing me with the copyright privilege to enable me to extract more income during the period I've made the work available. Just interested in the thoughts of yourself and anyone else in the panel on that issue. Sure. Um, <coughs> look, it is a really difficult... I don't, can you hear me all right? It is a really difficult um, issue. Uh, and, you know, I'm an artist, I'm a lapsed artist, my partner is an artist, and, you know, I respect the fact that some people do not want their work <coughs> used in specific ways, and I can perfectly understand many circumstances where an artist would say no, or an author, or whatever it might be. Um, I think the issue for an art gallery, uh, and working in an art gallery, is that the works of art there are actually owned by the public. And the fact that an art, and it's really um, very, very rare, but uh, it's mainly artists' estates who uh, make money out of licensing artwork, uh, and they have a huge amount of control. And um, you know, the, the Picasso Foundation and um, Braque and all those people, they're the ones who basically set up those collecting societies or influenced them right at the beginning. So it's all about making money for the next generation. And I have no issue at all with people wanting to make a reasonable income out of their copyright and for their children or whatever it might be. But um, the strange thing about some of the particularly with photography, there are issues around photographers wanting to protect their image because that's how they make a living, is by selling that image. So I can perfectly understand that. But we actually have a policy at the art gallery, for instance, that um, if an artist uh, or an estate can actually supply the image, we won't. So if somebody is going to reproduce um, a photograph from our collection, for instance, by, I don't know, say, um, Fiona Hall or somebody like that, if Fiona can, would rather uh, provide it, or Rosemary Lang, we will send them to them. So we actually do have a very open policy and engagement with artists. The problem with Helmut Newton Estate is that they are, um, um, it is a very highly protected estate, and when they say no, they mean absolutely no. And unfortunately, the basis on which they said no was because he was being shown with somebody else. So it's a little bit of an ego thing, but that's their, their they say no, that's fine, we just respect that. But it does make it very difficult. Um, again, dealing with major estates for major exhibitions, it is hard work. It is a lot of hard work. It's a lot of negotiation, it's a lot of um, soothing eyebrows and, and all the rest of it. And, you know, it's just very, very difficult. So, in fact, it, you know, I don't know how we actually get through most weeks sometimes, particularly with <coughs> major exhibitions, uh, because it is about trying to strike a balance between what you need and what they want. But, you know, if they say no, that's it. There's, there's no... I don't know what other people's experience is. But it's difficult. Mm. Just very quickly, though, I mean, of course, if the reason for having copyright is to provide a greater incentive to create, then that does suggest that the rights attached to an estate where there can be absolutely no... I mean, incentive doesn't work after you're dead. 
um, perhaps we might be able to look at that on a policy basis and make the life of our art galleries easier when yes. we spent taxpayer money well, right. acquiring products and paying for it in their lifetime. I'll, I actually have got a funny story, which only will take a moment, and um, our beloved Edmund Capon, um, his uh, phrase was um, always um, F copyright. That was the phrase that always went down, and I don't blame him, because it was it's actually, it is a nightmare for art galleries. But um, a few years ago, we had to reproduce um, a postcard of for an artist, um, an Ian Fairweather, and we were being charged, I think, $400 for a Christmas card or something like that, and he just hit the roof. And he said, why are we paying money to go to an estate when he died intestate with two boxes to his name, cardboard boxes full of junk. Who the hell is getting that money? Who knows? I don't know. And it's, I have to say, it's, you know, the, the, the sort of arguments against the term of copyright being too long, lifetime plus 70 years, it's a hard one to kind of unravel with the various um, conventions that we're a party to in Australia. Although that's a, you know, it's, people have been talking about that for the last sort of 20 years or so. But the other problem is we need to think, are there, is there a need to have some more exceptions to balance um, the right to access and the public interest uh, exceptions that have been long recognised um, in intellectual property uh, for the last 200 years? And so I, I think the focus should be all more on is, are the acceptance we've got now suitable or do we need to have something that's more purpose-based rather than technology-based as we've been talking about? How do we make sure the balance is right? Um, this one here, and then now. Uh, Marcus Wigan, Electronic Frontiers. I was very interested by Delia's presentation, uh, which pressed for a more flexible approach to the utilization of copyrightable and IP within education. I'd be interested in her comments in the acquisitive approach of the educational institutions to acquire both the private and the public works of those employed by them which they tend to extend to students. And while this may not be universal, it's a growing trend to try to implement it. We must remember the WA case. Right, well, uh, the general, as you know, the general kind of rule in, in copyright is the, uh, most teachers, you talk about teachers' copyright, <coughs> or student, we don't claim students' copyright in the school and TAFE sector. But we're, we're talking about the educational sector, which includes universities, yeah. which have some extended and somewhat onerous conditions. Yes, they do. Uh, I represent the school and TAFE sector, <laughs> um, so I can't really comment on university practices. I can say there's a growing movement towards um, open education resources being developed by the states and territories in the school sector and the TAFE sector, and there's a growing uh, awareness and interest in actually um, making sure that stuff that we, uh, that we ourselves commission or create ourselves is provided on an open license basis for all to enjoy. And I think that's, that's going to be the interesting movement over the next five to ten years is the growth of the open education movement, open source movement, open content movement. And, uh, and that's starting to happen a little bit in the university sector in Australia. It's huge in the US and the EU. We're a little bit um, slow on the uptake here. And, that, and it's partly, again, uh, to do with the current regime we've got, which is statutory license based, it's just, you know, it's made things, it, it, the inflexibility means that we, we, we don't pick up things as quickly as perhaps um, other movements around the world. Hello, my question's to Tim and Donna, and then by extension to Delia, but I was picking up on Tim's point in his presentation where he was saying, you know, he can only do so, he can only explore, say, the content in Trove up to 1954, because beyond that, what you have access to is restricted under copyright, and Donna talking about the types of works in the collection, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, for example, do appropriation artworks or works that contain other third-party content affect your acquisition decisions in the gallery? So whether we're developing a very comprehensive record, and then similarly to Tim, like in terms of the types of ways we can explore collections and whether they are limited by the copyright restrictions we have. Um, you need the microphone. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, copyright generally is a big issue in. Uh, digital history, digital humanities, which is the sort of broader 
uh, aspect, and, and we've had uh, you know uh, cases around obviously digitised books. Uh, you know there was a, a case. You know, not been a number of cases because you know people want to use again, as, as I was sort of saying, use that sort of material in different ways. So other than just reading a book, want to get access so they can actually do sort of processing of, of large amounts of words and and making that material available. Uh, in a form you can do that. And you know, it's really frustrating uh, from Australia um, ac trying to access <coughs> sort of stuff in sort of Hathi Trust or Google Books because they're applying sort of, as I understand it, and I don't really understand it, their sort of copyright restrictions, which is limiting us, uh, our access, which w would normally have allowed us, even if it was sort of based in Australia, then we would get access to some of this stuff which we can't get access to. <coughs> I don't know if that makes any sense. But anyway, but yes, I mean, there are obviously all sorts of ways where the, our topics of study are being limited by the resources that are made available. And part of that uh, is obviously related to copyright. Um, and, you know, it, it's, I mean, our areas of study are always skewed by what sources are available. You know, that has always been the case. It's not a new thing in the digital realm. You know, before the Trove newspaper database was around, we had to rely on printed indexes to newspapers. So it means if you look at historical research over the you know, past whatever many years, you'll see lots of citations to the Sydney Morning Herald and not a lot of citations to other newspapers because they were more accessible. <laughs> um, so there's always ways in where sort of, you know, our possibilities for studying things are going to be limited. But now, I suppose, because it, it's because we can glimpse what's possible, <laughs> we can glimpse that sort of, you know, broader access, it's even more frustrating in a way. I'm glad you asked that, in a way, I think. Um, look, at the Art Gallery in New South Wales, it doesn't actually have an effect um, about appropriation art. Uh, we have had um, exhibitions where people have complained that we haven't for instance, put up a citation of where, for instance, some source material has come from. There are artists like Juan de Villa um, and others that actually put the source of their appropriation in their painting, which is actually very nice of them. Um, but there are art galleries I do know of in Australia, uh, one in particular that does, uh, is now rather nervous about acquiring works of art that actually include third party material. And in the end, there was one series of works that they did actually acquire, but they may never publish. Now, for me, that is actually not doing that artist a favour. It's actually not doing the public a favour, and in fact, it's the most stupid thing you can possibly imagine. I mean, you know, really, you just got to take a risk. And, uh, and I think it's very difficult for art galleries to do that under the current um, framework, a uh, copyright framework, and there are works of art that we would love to put up and that we're constantly assessing as to whether or not we're going to take the risk. And some of those are orphan works. Um, <laughs> and it's just a constant issue. And for me, I think the fact that there are thousands of works of art that we can't put on the internet, that we may already have a photograph of, and we have the information online, and people want to see what that work is, that we can't do that. And isn't there a problem with that artist then being lost in history? Well, it, it, interestingly enough, there is a couple of examples. One is, um, I think, Margaret Preston, whose work uh, used to be under a, um, an estate run through uh, perpetual trustees or somebody like that. And uh, everyone was able to, even though we sought permission, be able to use that work for free. Uh, that changed. and I won't go into the circumstances, but it now Margaret Preston is um, reproduced by Viscopy and you see less and less of her work being reproduced. There's also an Aboriginal artist whom I also won't mention, but um, whose work basically has disappeared off the face of this um, planet. And because his copyright owner is so uh, controlling and unreasonable, and it makes it almost impossible to use that artist's work. In fact, we've had to pull it from um, a, a major book on Aboriginal art where that person should be in that book and they are not there. And it's absolutely disgraceful. Okay, well, I'm sorry, but uh, we need to wrap up today. It's uh, already well past quarter past. So thank you. If you could just join with me in thanking Tim, Donna and Delia.
Now, in wrapping up today, there's a number of people that I would uh, like to thank for their support and assistance with making today happen. Firstly, Internet New Zealand, who have been a sponsor. Thank you very much for your support. Uh, <laughs> To the staff of the National Portrait Gallery for your uh, help and support in, in making today such a great day. Um, to the team that have looked after the sound and the vision, to uh, Damien and his team, thank you guys. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who um, participated today by way of ideas and suggestions for speakers, those who did speak and prepared papers, particularly to our two keynote speakers, uh, Matthew Sag and Judge David Harvey. Thank you very much. Um, there's been a couple of volunteers in the background, Millie and Sam. Thank you, Millie and Sam, for your help. Um, and when Ellen wrote this list, she left one very important person off, and that's Ellen herself. Um, <laughs> Without Ellen, and Ellen is the executive officer for the ADA, she uh, is fabulous and she does a wonderful job and thank you Ellen for pulling this together today. Now just lastly, uh, a little bit of an ad for the ADA. Um, as Derek mentioned this morning, we have a very busy year ahead of us. Um, the ADA is a very small organisation. Um, Ellen is basically the ADA. Last year we were lucky to have uh, Eloise, who I think is still in the audience, to help particularly around the work for the ALRC uh, submission. We know we've got a busy year this year again and uh, we've got a lot to work, of work to do. So the ADA website has a brand new donation page. So we're asking you to help support the work of the ADA by becoming a member if, or making a donation. Um, join the mailing list, spread the words. We have a Twitter account which is um, Oz underscore digital. Uh, all those details will be on the website. So please, um, if you're not a member, we would really encourage you to do that and to um, help our work. That's it. We perhaps look forward to seeing you again next year. Thank you.